hello everyone. My name is Emily Perry. I'm um, the I run the Ensemble Outreach Team. So what we do as a group is we go out to various different locations and we basically let people know about what's going on with Ensemble. We teach people how to use it. Um, I don't think I'm being picked up here, am I? Let's try moving this. Am I now being? No. Sorry. Combine the two and put it here. Is that better? OK. Um, I'll try and speak very loudly as well. Um, so what we do is we try and kind of let people know about what Ensemble is doing. Uh, we also answer help queries. We produce online help and documentation. And we also teach lots and lots of workshops uh, like this one. Um, please interrupt me at any time. I would, if you're ever confused, if anything that I've said is not clear, I would far rather you stop me and then I can go over that um, and make it clear to everybody than for you to sit there being confused. So do please stop me at any point today. Um, as has been mentioned before, all the materials for today's workshops are available. So you can get a copy of the presentation and also a copy of the hands-on tutorial that we'll be doing. Um, so, Ensemble is a genome browser like UCSC, um, and we have lots and lots of features. So, we have what we call gene builds for about 70 species. For human and mouse, these are the gen code um, gene sets. We have gene trees, so every single gene that we have, we compare pairwise to every single other gene. We then produce gene trees, and we infer orthologs and paralogs from these trees. We have a regulatory build which is what the focus of today's um, workshop is going to be on, which incorporates data from ENCODE as well as other sources. We have uh, variation displays. We have a tool called the VEP, um, which we'll also look at. We allow you to display your own data. We have a tool called Biomart for data export, which we'll have a quick go with. Um, we also have programmatic access via APIs. So we have a Perl API and a REST API. If you're interested in either of those things, please come and talk to me. Uh, we are also completely open source, so every single bit of code, every single bit of software is free, is open, is available for you to use, to do whatever you want with. Um, so regulation is one section of what we do, and what we're trying to do is annotate the genomes with features that play a role in transcription and regulation of genes. So we're talking about the actual features here, the promoters, the enhancers, the insulators. And we're using data such as predicted open-closed chromatin um, from DNA's one sensitivity. We're using transcription factor binding sites. We're using the epigenetic marks, the histone modifications, and the DNA methylation. And we're using RNA polymerase binding. You'll recognize that most of these features are things that are produced by the ENCODE project for the cell lines that they work with. Um, so we're predicting these kinds of features, but some of the things that we're not doing um, so we're not linking them to genes. We show them where you are. We show you the, where the features are, and we let you make your own inferences from them. We also don't link to gene expression. So you can access the gene expression from all the cell types. You can see where the features are. Again, make your own inferences. The reason for this is this kind of data. We don't have kind of assays saying this enhancer enhances this gene. That kind of stuff just isn't there on a large scale. There's a few assays out there, but it's not on any kind of a, as much of a large scale. So what we're saying is, we think there's an enhancer at this particular position. We'll tell you why we think there's an enhancer at that particular position. And we're leaving it up to you to do the assays that will link these kinds of data together, that will link the enhancer to the gene that it activates to show kind of what binding is involved when it is activated, um, when it activates particular genes. So at the moment, um, the current data we have, we have ENCODE data for human um, and for mouse, and we also have data from roadmap epigenomics um, that we produce this regulatory build with. But we have stuff coming up in future. Um, so for human, we've got Blueprint coming in. Um, we're getting involved at the early stages with the FANG project. Um, which is a very similar project, but with agricultural um, species and also with the zebrafish, um, Zen code. We're getting in at the early stages, making sure that we're working with the data coordinators for these projects 
so we can pull in the data as soon as it comes out. We're working with a subset of cell types, um, and the reason for this is, um, as you'll see when I start to talk about the build, we need certain amounts of data. We need, in order to build our predicted in promoters, enhancers, insulators, we need CTCF binding. We need a marker of open chromatin, and we need these three histone modifications. If we have this data for a cell type, we will then carry out our regulatory build on that cell type, and we will display all data that is known for that cell type. We also have the option to add further data using track hubs, and I will show you how to do that. So, we're taking data from various sources. We're processing it to predict the activity, um, the positions and the activity of various features, and we're predicting the activity in cell types. You can view this in the genome browser. You can access it via um, Biomart, both of which I will show you how to do, and you can also access it via our Perl API, which um, requires a lot of installation, installation and a lot of um, setup and a lot of um, programming knowledge and things in order to access. So we're not going to cover that here, but if you want to talk to me about it, I will um, please come and see me. So what we're looking at is, is raw data. We look, we're starting off with our histone modifications with our transcription factor binding sites. So um, as Pauline mentioned, we're looking at peaks and the signal that produces those peaks. And what we're doing is we're, we're processing it. So we're starting with something that looks like this, and we're looking for regions that look like they might be interesting, where there's quite a lot of stuff going on. And what we have is a, a, blind, um, a blind pipeline which says, OK, here's a pattern. Here's a group of features that we see clustered together. Can I see that cluster anywhere else in the genome? looks all over the genome, finds that we often see this cluster coming together. And we also know that two of these are known promoters. If we know that two of the places where we see this cluster are promoters, the rest of it is quite logically also promoters. So this is what our, our pipeline is doing. Of course, it's not as simple as saying every time we see this, it's a promoter and nothing else is a promoter because it turns out that this slightly different collection of features also promoters. Another slightly different collection is also promoters. So it's not so simple. We don't say, right, these things are promoters, these things are enhancers, because there are subtle differences between them. Um, and we see that there are different patterns that all lead to the same kind of functionality. So this produces what we call segmentation regions of the genome that we believe carry out particular functions. We can then, because this is in a cell type specific manner, we can then plot the segmentations all on top of each other. And we can say, well, obviously there are differences. These are different cell types. They're carrying out different functions. Um, and they'll have different activity. So what we want to take from this is, based on all the different activity that we can see in all these cell types, what actually are the different regions? What are they doing? So we start with a 200 base pair bin. We have a look at what's in it. And we say, well, that region, because we've got some promoter activity, that region is a promoter. And we move along in these 200 base pair bins, calling them as different kinds of activity, as promoters, as enhancers, based on the fact that we have some activity in some cell types. And I always, I need to make this animation move more quickly because I always end up with loads of extra time. Let's just assume that it's all finished. Um, so now we can say we've got these features across the cell types. Um, and we can say these are the regions that are doing these particular activity. We've now defined our boundaries. We've now defined exactly where in the genome a promoter is, exactly where in the genome an enhancer is. Of course, this is in 200 base pair boundaries, so um, in bins. So we, don't, we can't say the actual boundaries seem to differ between cell types because, of course, we're working with things like chipset data, which have fuzzy edges. We can then um, say, well, for these features that we've called, are they active or inactive in different cell types? So within these specific boundaries that we've said, 
apply to the whole, um, apply to the genome. We can then say, well, this enhance, this promoter is active in cell type one. It's inactive in cell type two and cell type three. It's active in cell type four. So we display active features as these colored blocks, inactive as gray blocks with the hashed lines through them telling you what color they are. Through this kind of analysis, we've covered quite a significant proportion of the genome. So there's about 300 um, megabases which have been categorized as being some kind of regulatory feature by this analysis. Um, so it's not quite the full set of, of everything that's been covered because obviously um, it's not quite the 80% that's everything that ENCODE has, but everything that we have sufficient evidence to say is a particular activity um, is about 10% um, of the genome. So um, what really sort of, I want to show you how you can see this kind of data in Ensemble and what you can learn about it. So we're going to start by looking at the region of the gene and we'll see the regulatory features and we'll see the activity in different cell types and what evidence there is to show this. And we'll also have a go at a quick biomark query um, and we'll get the loci and functions and some regulatory features. So all of these features I mentioned have an ID that look like this, ENSR, ENS telling you it's ensemble, R telling you it's a regulatory feature, and then an 11-digit number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Ensemble Genome Browser, which is at ensemble.org. Um, I'll just point out a few things on this home page before I start showing you some of the um, regulatory features. So what we've got is this blue bar along the top, which is um, always going to be visible. You've got a search. Um, you've got a link back to the home page. You've also got a login slash register here. So one of the things that you can do is you can set up an account um, where you don't have to pay any money and nobody will ever, ever send you any spam email, which is very important when setting up a, a, an account anywhere, um, which means that you can do things like save stuff to your account, share between groups, this kind of thing. Um, we've got some links to what your favorite genomes might be, so you can click through to human or mouse. Um, and there's also a list where you can see all of the species. So there's about 70 species there. If you go to this view full list, you'll see all of them. Um, another thing I want to point out is it says here what's new in Ensemble Release 80. Um, so one of the things that we do in Ensemble is we have a system of regular releases. So whenever we get new data, whenever we get new tools, instead of just putting it out there straight away, we hold on to it. And we put everything out in one go, which we call a release. We do these releases every two to three months. Um, and they all have a number stuck on them. What this means is when you get data um, from Ensemble, you can write down in your lab book, got the data, Ensemble release 80, la, 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 la. Six months later, you go back. You're looking through your lab book. You go to the page that you were looking at, and you find that the data has changed. And you're thinking, did I write that down wrong, or has the data changed? The easy way to find out the answer to that question is to scroll down to the bottom of the page, click to the, on this link that says View in Archive Site, and you get a pop-up listing previous releases of Ensemble that are available. So you can say, aha, right, I'm going to go to Ensemble Release 80. I'm going to see what I was looking at back then, and I will discover that what I wrote down was actually completely sensible at that time. Um, it's just that the data has changed since then. So we're going to search for um, a gene. So we've got a search box here um, where you can put all kinds of things into this search box. You can put gene names. You can put go terms. You can put phenotypes. Um, you can put... Um, coordinates, you can put IDs, they can be ensemble IDs, they can be RefSeq IDs, um, all kinds of different things can go into the search box. I'm just going to put in a gene name, LIMD2. And it takes me to search results, which I can narrow down if I want to. So if, if I've done a search for something like insulin, I'm going to get loads of results here. Um, 
And I might want to narrow it down. I'll get insulin dependent and insulin interacting and all that kind of thing. I might want to narrow it down so I would just see genes and I would just see human. And then I would know I might get a much shorter list that I could easily search through rather than trying to handle the thousands of results I might get if I search for a word like insulin. In this case, we've got LMD2 right at the top of the list. And I'm going to click on these coordinates here. So I can jump to the gene or I can jump to the coordinates of the location. So I'm going to go to the location. And we'll have a look um, at the region. So this is the region in detail page. This is probably one of the most accessed pages um, in Ensemble. So what we have is we have an overview of the chromosome at the top. This red box is us. This is where we're currently looking. We have a sort of overview of our region of interest. This is um, a megabase surrounding our gene. Again, we have a colored box showing us where we are. Um, and these blocks are all our genes. If you follow the net leftmost point of a box down, you'll reach um, the leftmost point of a label telling you what gene it is. Um, and this is where we currently are. I can scroll around. I'll just reset that back. Or I can switch to a draggy box. I can drag out a box around something that I'm interested in. Um, what I would like to do, because I'm currently looking at a gene, because when we're looking at regulatory features, we're normally looking at a gene plus the region surrounding it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drag out a bigger box around where I currently am and jump to that region. So I have my gene plus some flank. So this is my region in detail, my sort of detailed view at the bottom. I've got my genes here. Um, I've got colored blocks showing me my, ex my coding exons, empty blocks showing me empty exons, lines connecting showing me the introns. Um, so this is the gene that I searched for, the LIMD2. Um, it's negative stranded, which I can tell because this little arrow is pointing that way in the direction of transcription. It's also shown underneath the blue contig. Um, so this gene here is positive stranded. It's above the blue contig. These ones down here are negative stranded. And as I scroll to the bottom, I can see this track here, these regulatory features. So these are the features I was talking about um, in the presentation. These are the sort of blocks of activity um, with known activity. We also have a legend um, at the bottom here. If I hover over the track name, you'll see it gives me, it just tells me features from the, on this is where I completely fail to, I put on giant mouse so it's easier for you to see the mouse, but then it makes it really hard for me to aim. Um, we have this a link here to find out more about the Ensemble Regulatory Build. So if you wanted to find out more about what you were looking at, um, you could go to that link there. Um, but we have these colored blocks. I can see that this red one here is a promoter. Um, these blue ones are CTCF. And this purple one is a transcription factor binding site. The black um, dashes throughout the features, these ones, are transcription factor motifs. So it's telling us this is a short sequence which is known to bind a particular transcription factor. So if I want to find out more about this feature, I can click on it. So you can click on any feature that you see in a browser. You'll get a little pop-up. Um, and there's normally a link um, so you can investigate it more. So we have an ENSR link because this is a regulatory feature. We also have a list of all of those transcription factor binding motifs um, with links to JASPER matrices and scores um, as well. I'm going to jump straight to the um, stable ID of this promoter. And we'll find out a bit more about this promoter and its activity. So this is the summary page for the regulatory feature. And um, you can see a graphical display showing you which cell types it's active in. So here it is in the multi-cell feature, but we can see it's inactive in A549, active in DND41, and so forth. You could count these um, 
and sort of note down what they all are, or you could look at this sort of quick summary here, active in 6 out of 18, and a list um, of the different cell types that it's active in. The moment when we have only 18 cell types, it's pretty easy to just sort of see it visually, but in the future we plan to have more and more cell types as more and more people produce more and more data, in which case you probably want to um, go with summaries um, in a lot of cases, unless there's something particular you're looking for. So we can see the cell types it's active and inactive in. So the two cell types I'm going to look at um, in a bit more detail, I'm going to look at one where it's active, which are these HUVEX cells, and one where it's inactive, the healers. And the way I can find more details is to go to this details by cell type link. So what this allows me to do is see more detailed information um, by cell type, so it's really well named. Um, so it's already showing me these HUVEX cells by default, but I want to see more cell types. So I have this um, button here that says select cells, showing one out of 18, so I'm going to click on it, and it will give me a list of the different cell types, um, and I'm going to pick the healers. Note that I could also do all on or all off or do a, a filter, which again is something that will become more and more useful as we introduce more and more cell types. So I'll just click anywhere outside the box to close it. And now it will load up with the HeLa cells, where, as we already knew, it's inactive. Um, it's also showing me the evidence that was used to create these, so the transcription factor binding, the histone modifications and things that we used to create this. Um, and we list that as evidence. But as we can see from this button here, it's only showing eight out of the 99 possible types of evidence that we have available. So if I click on Select Evidence, it now shows me all the possible types of evidence which are, are categorized. And I'm not going to go through and select them one by one. I'm just going to turn everything on. And now I save and close. And now what we can see are the different kinds of features um, that are available um, that we can see within this promoter. And we can see perhaps why um, in one case they were, it was listed as active and in other, the other inactive. So in the HEVEC cells where we have this active promoter, you can see that we've got open chromatin with this DNA's um, sensitivity. We've got a transcription factor binding. We've got some histone modifications. Um, that are markers of, of um, activity, and we've also got um, polymerase binding, generally a good sign that this is active. Compare this to our healers where it's inactive, we're missing most of that. The only thing we've got is CTCF and DNA is binding, which seems to correspond to this active CTCF binding site over here, seems to be unrelated to this um, promoter as well. Uh, we mentioned peaks and signal. I can also turn on signal if I want to using this button at the top. So if I want to see the sort of graphs with squiggly lines, I can do um, if I prefer to see that kind of thing. And you can see that the graphs support what we can see um, in these peaks. If you want to look over a whole region, rather than just at one particular feature, you can do so. So I'll go back to my location tab. Um, so we have this system of tabbing, um, which makes it easy to jump between different kinds of features. So if you're interested in a gene and then start looking at a regulatory feature in the gene and go, want to look at a location, you can jump back and forth um, using these tabs that will appear as you open up different features. So currently what we've got displayed in this region view is just the multi-cell regulatory features, these features that are just saying this region does that, this region does that, doesn't give you any, any indication of um, their activity in different cell types. But if I want to get that activity, um, you can change everything that you can see in, this, um, in the browser by clicking on this configure this page menu. And what this does there's about 2,500 different tracks that you can see um, that are available to you. Um, obviously, most of them are not currently shown, but you can get access to all of them by clicking on Configure This Page, 
We have uh, menus down the side, so if I know I'm interested in variation data, I can click on variation in the left-hand side, and I'll get a big menu listing all the possible tracks which are related to variation, uh, which can be one way that I could do things. Or we also have a finder track here. So if I kind of, if I just know the name of something and I'm not quite sure what category it's going to be in, or it might be quicker in some cases, I can just put in healer, for example. Um, and now I have the option to add the regulatory features um, for healer cells. That's also found in this regulatory feature menu. Um, so I'll add the regulatory features for HeLa and for Huvex. Some of the tracks that you'll add, when you click on them, you'll get a little pop-up asking you what style you want to put it in. You can mess around and read. There is an FAQ that describes what all the track styles mean, or you can just turn it on, see what it looks like, and change it if it doesn't look how you want it to look, which, to, me, to my mind, is the easiest way um, to do anything. So that's the regulatory features. If I want to also see the evidence, that's also available. Um, underneath regulatory features in this menu, I've got open chromatin and transcription back to binding sites. And now we can see some more detailed data. So down the side, we have all the transcription factors that are available. And along the top, we have all the different cell types that are available. If I want to turn on a particular track, I can just click on the box. It will go blue, telling me that I have turned the track on. When I do that, it picks me a track style. So there are some tracks that are already shown um, picked by default. It's generally assumed that you might be interested in open chromatin and in CTCF. So these are on, but they're not actually on until you pick a track style. Um, but when you pick something, it then gives you a track style for that cell type. Um, you can also say, well, I want to see all of a particular transcription factor in all of the cell types. So there's a select all option there. And you can do the same with the, um, the cell type. So I can say I want to see all for the healers, which is what I'll do, and the same for the Huvex. So it's picked me a track style. In both cases, it's picked me peaks. So if I click on the track style options, you'll see that I can have off, which is what I've got for most of my cell types. I can have peaks, so these are the blocks. I can have signal, squiggly lines, or I can have whoops, both squiggly lines and boxes. Um, I'm going to leave it just on peaks for both of them. I can do the same if I go into histones and polymerases. Um, and it's exactly the same sort of matrix, works in exactly the same way. So I can say Huvex cells and HeLa cells. Oops, I didn't manage to hit that. Everything is now on. So now when I close um, the um, menu, it's going to take a moment to load. While that's loading, um, no, I'll sh show you the data first and then. So what we have now, you can see we've got the active, the promoter in the multi-cell. Um, so the multi-cell has kind of got this pale blue highlighting down the side. I don't know if you can see it very well. Um, and then when we go into the Huvex cells, we have this darker blue, so you can see everything that's that cell type because it's got this dark blue band. And the same with the healers, it's got the green band, so you can see everything. If I decide to move something, so one of the things that you can do is you can move things around. If I want to see how these features um, match up to these genes over here, what I might want to do is pick it up and drag it and line it up next to the genes. I can't see where it's gone now. That's something that I can do, but of course now it's not next to the thing that says healer cells, but it's still got that green, and I can scroll down and go, oh yes, the green, that's the healers um, that I've put on there. So that's kind of how you can um, look at the regulatory features in the browsers. I also want to show you track hubs. So if I go back to the home page, there's a link here that says Ensemble supports data from external projects through track hubs. <coughs> so I'll click on this, and it lists a bunch of track hubs that are available. Um, as Pauline said, these are... Um, 
data that are hosted at the, the locations that they originally come from. Um, but you can see here we've got hub names, descriptions, and it also tells us what species and what genome assembly they're found on. So the main um, ensemble browser is based on GRCH38, the most recent human genome. But of course, we know that a lot of people are still working with the older genome, GRCH37. Um, and many of the hubs that we have are still, have not been moved across and are only on GRCH37. Because we know lots of people are working on GRCH37, we have a site dedicated to that, which we'll see in a moment. So if I click on the ENCODE analysis hub, which has not yet been moved over, what it will do is it will take me to the dedicated GRCH37 site. So you can see, just in the background, I'm now on an ensemble site, but it says GRCH37 at the top. The URL is grch37.ensemble.org, and it's a different, um, different shade of blue. Um, and now I'm in the personal data section. It says ENCODE Analysis Hub. It gives me a link to where the data actually is. Um, and if I, it also has options to save it to my account to share it, also to get rid of it. Um, so if you're finding it's, you've put on a bunch of hubs and everything is really slow, then um, you might want to consider deleting them um, from your ensemble. Obviously, you won't delete them from the world um, because it's making look, things a bit slower for you. Um, but if I go into Configure Hub, it takes me back to the Configure menu that I was in earlier. It does get a bit slow when I've added this kind of thing because it is quite a lot of data. And now I have ENCODE Analysis Hub um, shown at the top of my menu. And I can go into things like RNA signal um, and get these data. I've got a, a matrix display very similar to what I had before. But the difference is now um, these boxes have got numbers in them. So we have a zero in the top corner. That tells me how many tracks I've selected. And a larger number in the bottom corner telling me how many tracks are actually available. So if I click on this, it then lists for me all of the tracks that are available. Um, and you can see I can just turn them all on, which I'll go for in compact. Or I could do them one at a time. So now it's telling me I've turned on 12 out of 12. If I save and close. And this is just a random region of the genome that it's taken me to. It doesn't really matter. It does slow it down. Aha. So now I can see I've got my signal levels um, for all these different tracks, which I can hover over and um, see what they're, the full names of them and things like that. I didn't point out but it's worth um, earlier, but it's worth looking out on any page that you ever go to for this little I, um, this info button. It looks like a tourist information sign. If I click on it, what it does is it opens up a pop-up which takes me through what's on the page. So it lists different kinds of features. There are screenshots, there are labels, there are all kinds of different things. In this case, there's also a video. There's not always a video. Um, it depends on the page, but this one has a video, and in a moment you will see Denise. I haven't got my sound on, so you can't hear her, but she is chatting away, and she's telling you all about um, what you can see on this page and the different kinds of things to look out for. So it is worth looking out any page that you um, go on to for these little info buttons because they will take you through if you're ever confused about what it is um, that you're looking at. I'm going to go back to the main ensemble page now. And um, I said we were going to have a go at a Biomart query as well. So Biomart is a nice little tool for data export. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've got these um, list of regulatory features. So these are just their IDs. And I'm going to get some data on them. Just remind myself of what data I wanted to get. So I'll just copy these. 
And um, Biomart is found in the top blue bar, and it's a really nice, easy tool to use for um, data export. So when I go into Biomart, um, the first thing I need to do is choose what database I'm looking at. So if I open up this menu, um, the data I'm looking at is going to be regulation data. So you can see I could get gene data, I could get variation data. I could also access um, Vega, which is uh, gene, manual gene annotation data um, that is incorporated into the Ensemble genes, but you can look at it by itself as well. So I will pick Ensemble Regulation 80. Now I choose my data set. So the regulation database is split into different sections in Biomart. So we can look at um, the binding motifs. So these are your sort of short sequences that bind particular transcription factors. Uh, we've got other regulatory regions. So this is data from sources such as Phantom 5. We have the regulatory evidence. So that's the actual transcription factor binding, the histo modifications and things like that. We have the features. Um, which is what we're going to look at, the um, sort of promoters, the enhancers, etc. We have the regulatory segments. So these were um, the sort of data that was used to construct the features. And we also have the microRNA target regions. So I'm going to go to the features. And um, we're going to filter our data. So now what we're currently showing, what Biomart is, has found for me, are all of the regulatory features in the genome. So what I want to do is to get Biomart to filter it down so I can only see the regulatory features when I go to my results, so I can only see the ones that I am interested in. So if I click on filters, I now get a bunch of stuff that I can use to narrow this data down. So you can see I've got various region filters. Um, so I can use chromosomes, coordinates. I can use chromosome bands, markers. Um, I can use the pilot regions. I can say I'm only interested in particular feature types or particular cell types. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste in, I've got this regulatory stable ID, and I'm just going to paste in my list. Now, this will accept lists in um, comma-separated, tab-separated, uh, carriage-return separated. And um, I want to click on the little tick whoops, to say that that's my filters. I've narrowed it down. These are the regulatory features that I'm interested in. If I now go into attributes, it shows me the things that I might want to see, that I might want to print in my table about my regulatory feature. Um, so I've got selected already by default chromosome name, start, end, and feature type. Um, I'm also going to add regulatory stable ID so we can see the IDs um, that we put in in the first place. If I now hit results, I get a table um, that lists all these features. Um, one of the things it's doing, which is slightly frustrating, um, is it gives me a new line for every possible new bit of data it thinks I could have. In the case of the regulatory features, this means that it gives me a new line for every cell type. Now, I haven't picked any attributes that are based on cell types. Um, so what I can do to get rid of this is to click on unique results only, and now it, it checks whether the line is the same as any other line or if it's different. Um, so now you can see I've got a different line um, for each feature. It's just showing me a preview of the first 10 rows um, of my query. The reason for this is uh, loading time. If I did a query that got me 100,000 rows as... Um, as my output, it might take a little bit of time to load. If I were to then discover, whoops, I meant to put in another column there, and I've just spent 10 minutes waiting for something to load, I'm going to be really, really frustrated. So what it does is it shows me a preview of the first 10 lines, which loads very quickly. I can check. I can see which columns I've put in, whether I've missed anything out. And if I have missed anything or I've added anything I don't need, I can go back into my filters or my attributes, and I can change it, and it's all nice and quick. Once I've then found everything I want, I can say I want to view all. And in this case, it's only a short one, so I don't have a bunch of extra stuff. But it, it, I can then load it. I can also download these data. So I can export the data um, to a file or to a compressed file. 
I can also get it as a compressed web file, which will notify by me by email. This is, again, really good if you're doing a massive query. So if you download your data as a file, it kind of generates the data, um, and, and at the same time, it's sending it to you. So it needs to maintain um, a connection with your computer the whole time it's generating the data. If you lose connection for even a moment during that time, what happens is it just cuts off the query at that point um, and just sends you what it's got so far, and it doesn't give you any warning that it's done this. If you pick compressed web file, notify by email, it does all of the, the processing. It creates everything within our system. It doesn't need to communicate with you. It only communicates with you when it's finished, and it sends you an email, and it gives you um, a link to a file that you can download. So if you're doing a big query, that's the way to do it. You can get these data as HTML, as CSV, as TSV, and as Excel. Um, a quick word of warning about do downloading any kind of genome stuff in Excel. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with Oct4 or Sept9 and attempted to put those gene names into an Excel spreadsheet and gone back later to see that you've got a date where you put your gene names. Um, so do make sure if you put anything into Excel to tell Excel to read everything as plain text. Um, otherwise, you're going to find some mess in there. Um, so that's kind of Biomart. Just to note, all of these are links, so I could jump um, here and find out um, a bit more about this regulatory feature. So we've got um, 25 minutes to have a go at the exercises. So as has been mentioned, all the materials are available on um, the meeting page. And there's a link to the hands-on tutorials where you will find a document that looks a bit like this. Um, this takes you through um, the walkthrough that I just gave, so you could repeat that if you wanted to um, by yourself. It also gets to a certain point, da, 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 eventually, where you've got some exercises that you can have a go at by yourself, um, having a look at some of the features you can do these exercises, you can have a look at your own regions of interest. Um, and um, so there's some using the browser, and there's some using Biomart. Again, it's up to you which ones you choose to do. There's also answers um, for all the exercises, so taking you through how to actually do them and what you should find um, with them. So if you want to, to check the answers, you can do that as well. And then um, when we've had a go at the exercises, we'll have a look at the variant effect predictor. Um, you can ask me questions about anything that relates to, to this or to doing these exercises or anything um, of interest to you about ensemble um, and ensemble regulation. And I will be wandering around um, and wave at me if you want my attention. And hopefully, all of you won't wave at me at once.